All right, good to see all of you once again. Lesson 17, you guys have been hanging in there a long time. We're down to three classes, so appreciate you uh, staying with the study. Tonight, we are definitely shifting gears because we're drawing, drawing our attention now to the heavenly host that are loyal to the Most High God. And uh, I think we have some exciting things to look at this evening, particularly as we look at all the things that they're about doing. So uh, let's begin with a word of prayer and we'll, we'll get underway. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for the opportunity to come together on a weeknight to study the Word of God. I don't think it gets better than that. So we, we thank you for the freedom to be able to do this. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to present uh, this material. I pray that the saints that are here and those that might be viewing this presentation would all be encouraged with the study this evening. We ask your blessing on it. And we also, Lord, we pray that you would be honored and glorified during this time as well so that you would be lifted up. As we're studying the unseen realm, it's really all about you and your ordering of all things. So um, we invite you into this time and ask your blessing on all that we do this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, thus far, you know, for the better part of the course, certainly, certainly since lesson number six and moving forward, We've been looking at these three primeval rebellions. One certainly was in Genesis chapter three. I did not spend a lot of time on that. That was the interaction of the serpent with Eve. Uh, it's been referred to a number of times. The, the second one was Genesis chapter six, the sons of God coming down and being involved with women and then begatting uh, a race of giants. We did spend a lot of time on that and the ramifications that that had for the people of God going into the promised land. We explored in conjunction with that the books of Jude, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. And then we looked at the third primeval rebellion, Genesis chapter 10, chapter 11, Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 and 9, and Psalm 82. You put that all together and it gives us the background on what happened there when God disinherited the nations at the Babel event, and then chapter 12 of Genesis narrows everything down onto one man and will make a nation out of him, but the design was always for the nations to be brought back in, and that's how we all got here this evening. Um, we, we noted that it would take hundreds and hundreds of years for that to be realized, but uh, that's what Jesus did on the cross, and he gives that great commission and at the end of uh, Matthew in chapter 28 that we're to go in the world and preach the gospel to all nations, to all the world. And that's the realization going all the way back to Genesis 12 verse 1 when Abraham is called, in you all the nations of the earth would be blessed. But it would take a long time for that to be realized. So tonight, we're moving into looking at the loyal heavenly host, those that are in service to Yahweh. There are three things I want you to note about them. They worship God. Secondly, they serve God. And secondly, and then thirdly, they are faithful to God. Okay? Those are the three. And they have been elected by God as we have been elected by God. I've alluded to this uh, many times. You'll see it on the screen, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, speaking about us. Paul here speaking to the church at Ephesus, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Then we have Paul to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 21. He gives us this remark, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels to maintain these principles, etc. The point being that those who were elected, they didn't fall. Those who fell did. 
And the startling thing on this, we've alluded to this many times in this class, angels who have fallen or lesser Elohim who have fallen have no hope. Hebrews 2 verse 16, again on the screen, for assuredly he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Um, you and I are spiritual descendants of Abraham. Paul gets into this in Galatians. It's in some other places as well to make the point here that we have been spiritually grafted in to the people of God. So now we're going to take a look at them. I'm going to be using in large part an outline that has been uh, used by Michael Heiser in one of his books entitled Angels. I can't improve on it, so we're going to use it as is. I think it would be helpful. We're, we're going to be looking at terms that describe their being. This is where we're going to begin tonight. Terms that describe their being. And we're going to be looking at mostly terms and where they end up within the scripture itself. So that first term we need to look at, it's pretty obvious I think, is the word spirit. Spirit. We have it here in 1 Kings 22. This is, we looked at this passage dealing with Micaiah. Micaiah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab to go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said this while another said that. Then a spirit, you see the Hebrew there, came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, how? And he said, I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Then he said, that would be God, you are to entice him and go and prevail. So uh, we have this word here, though, in the Hebrew, the, the word for spirit. So this is the first word we're looking at that describes what they are. They're spiritual beings. Now, there's some observations I want to make here regarding uh, this 1 Kings 22 account. We'll first note that the heavenly hosts here are identified as, I said, spirit beings, and that Ahab's prophets were to be confounded by, quote, a lying spirit or a deceiving spirit who is identified as one of the heavenly hosts. It's very interesting. The work of this spirit resulted in a deliberate deception. We have that, 1 Kings 22, 21, and 22. And regarding the whole issue of deception, which is this is kind of hard for Christians to process, that you know, God would be a part of this or those loyal, the spirits loyal to him, Heiser offers this remark. He says, some readers may have difficulty with God's use of deception to judge evildoers, but it is plainly taught in scripture. At times the deception in the context of warfare, in other instances God uses deception to set the stage for his judgment. It is up to the righteous judge to determine how evil is punished. Now again, this is his remark on this and I, I certainly don't have any criticisms at all uh, for what he's actually saying here. In fact, it's very consistent with Reformed theology. Nonetheless, um, the, tonight's lecture, I'm using Heiser's outline, that, that we're right in the middle of his wheelhouse. This, this man's, you know, his PhD is in ancient languages and ancient Hebrew. So um, we're, we're right where he is. So you're going to be hearing a little more of, from him this evening in regards to some of the remarks of the language here because we're looking at a number of Hebrew terms and also Greek terms when we come to the New Testament. Continuing with this idea of them being spirits, spirits have been sent also to cause adverse circumstances among individuals or entire groups. Let's look at that. Judges chapter 9 beginning at verse 22. Now Abimelech ruled over Israel three years, then God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem, and the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. It's interesting here that the, it's, it's known that this particular spirit is an evil spirit. 
The other one that seemed to be part of the divine council with the Micaiah text uh, and, and uh, where were we? Kings. Um, looks like he's part of the divine council, but here we have an actual evil spirit being sent. We'll talk more about this in a minute. Let me get through some more examples of this. 1 Samuel 18, verse 10. Now it came about the next day that an evil spirit from God came mightily upon Saul, and he raved in the midst of the house. Again, Isaiah chapter 19, beginning of verse 13. The princes of Zoan have acted foolishly. The princes of Memphis are deluded. Those who are at the cornerstone of her tribes have led Egypt astray. The Lord has mixed within her a spirit of distortion. Again, we have Isaiah 37, beginning at verse 5. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah. Isaiah said to them, Thus you shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will put a spirit in him, so that he will hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will make him fall by the sword of his own land. Okay, so what we're learning here is the, the absolute foreordination of God. Secondly, we're also understanding in regards to his absolute control over all things. Even evil. This is why, uh, when we get to this, we talk a little bit about the, um, the Westminster Confession. I actually skipped that in my notes. I'll come to it now. If you're looking for more information on this, I would encourage you to take a look at the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 3, sections 1, 2, and 3, where you have it clearly delineated, based on passages like this and far more, that God ordains every single thing that happens. However, he is not the author of evil. The word of God will not permit that. I mean, being in our humanness, we, we take these two lines. We see the control over evil, the providence of God here, controlling all things, and we want to bring that together as an apex there. The scripture will not allow for it. Uh, this is, is not a contradiction, okay? You have both things that are being taught within the Word of God, and the basic thing I would suggest to you if you struggle with this at all is that we don't have all the information. See, it's hard for us to reason this out. And usually when I'm teaching this in a theology class, I, I, for those of you that have been around for a while, you've, you've seen this a number of times, where I'll, I'll take a pitcher of water and then I'll have a glass. And I'll say that this picture represents the mind of God, okay? And what was in it is all the information that's there. So it's filled to the brim. And then we have an empty glass, which represents us. And I just start pouring that in that glass. And we get to the point where it's three quarters full, then it's full, and then all of a sudden it's overflowing, okay? This leads to the Latin phrase uh, in understanding this, finitum non capax infinitum. The finite cannot, here's the key word, contain or grasp the infinite. And you've got to keep that fixed in your mind as we examine passages like this. We are finite. We have a beginning and we have an ending in this life. You're trying to understand a being that has no beginning, has no ending. And part of his attributes is that he is omniscient. He knows all things. He's omnipresent. He's present everywhere. Um, He's omniscient. He knows all things. He has all of these omnis that are there, besides immutability, besides aseity. And we don't have the understanding to get this down, to make that all fit. But what we do understand enough is, this is, this is not Star Wars. 
Okay, this is not a question of the force, where there's the dark side and there's the good side, right? You know, you have Darth Vader saying to his son, you don't know the power of the dark side. Well, while we talked about this several lessons ago, basically it's Taoism is what it is. It's, it's uh, you know, you, it's the yin and the yang, and you have this force that's there. This is not the picture that we have within the scripture. The picture in scripture is that God is on top and that even all of this rebellion that's going on in the world among in humanity is also happening in the unseen realm and he still overarching controls it to bring about his own predetermined will that he has purposed. Okay, if you don't hold to that, you end up with some kind of vacillation in here where God is not completely sovereign, and that's a dangerous place to be. If he's not completely sovereign and controls all things, then how can we count on any one of the promises that he's made within the scripture itself? It's because he has that kind of power and he has that kind of wisdom. So if you look at this and you think, I just can't make that fit, you got to remember that the scripture has given us information that's sufficient for the day, but it's not complete. Okay? I, you know, I don't, I don't, tr I, I trust when I get on board, you know, a 747, the thing's going to take off, it's going to fly. I don't know how it does it, but it does, you know. Someone knows why it does what it does, okay? Engineers that put it together and those that oversee the maintenance, of it, they know. Well, in this case, we don't know all of the facts. So don't be quick in your mind to say, boy, I, you know, that gives me a different view of God. Um, we don't have all of the information here. All right, that leads, for, we're going to leave that. We're moving off of spirits to... Another term, heavenly ones, heavenly ones. Heiser gives us a remark on this one as well, that the Hebrew word here occurs 400 times in the Hebrew Bible. In nearly all cases, the referent is either the visible sky, the space above the earth, or the spiritual realm beyond or above the visible sky in which God dwells. The Hebrew word is found always in the plural form. In a handful of passages, this word describes the members of God's supernatural host and should be translated, though it is often not, as heavenly ones for clarity on that point. This usage, usage should not, should uh, no, excuse me, this usually, this usage should be no surprise since it makes perfect sense that the members of the heavenly host should be called heavenly ones. So, we get down here to Psalm 89. You'll see my New American Standard puts it a little differently. The heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in the assembly of the holy ones. You've got it there. For who in the skies is comparable to the Lord, who among the sons of the mighty is like the Lord? And look what else you've got here. And a God greatly feared in the council of the holy ones. Awesome and above all those who are around him. Heavenly ones. So we come across that. We also come across the term stars. And we've had this. We've looked at this in the past. Celestial stars have always been identified with the heavenly ones. You've got it here in Job 38, a text that we've looked at more than once. Who set the measurements since you know? Or who stretched the line on it? Or what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Okay. That idea of stars is also not only within the scripture, but it's also in the ancient Near East, the understanding that those, the, these, they were celestial beings, that God knows them. And they're referred to it in this way. It's also interesting here that um, 
He's, he's dressing down uh, Job at this point. Who said it's measurements since you know? He's questioning his wisdom because he's questioning God on this. Or who stretched out the line on it? Or what were its bases sunk? This, this also applies to what we just covered. You know, you start looking at this and, think, well, I don't know, this thing about God controlling evil and all of these other things that are going on here. Well, here you got it. When God finally comes on the scene with Job and answering these why questions, he never answers them and overwhelms them with how grand and great he really is. I think that applies to the other issue as well. I'm also calling to your attention here in this regard regarding stars, the pride of the king of Babylon as he was analogized with the divine rebel Satan. We covered that in lesson number five. Pick it up at Isaiah 14, verse 13. But you said in your heart, this is re, you know, referring to this, um, this Babylon king, Babylonian king, but he um, also seems to be representing someone else here. And we looked at that, and we thought that this applied um, to none other than the evil one. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. You've got two references there, I think, to the divine council. The throne above the stars of God. There they are, stars. And there's no doubt here what we're talking about. The mount of the assembly. We'll deal with the word assembly a little bit later. But here we have it. Okay. So, another term here that's used. Stars. Heavenly ones, stars. We also have holy ones. Holy ones. Psalm 89, verses 5 to 7. The heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies is comparable to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty is like the Lord? Again, they're all Elohim because they're spiritual beings. But Yahweh is the most high God. There's nothing that comes close to approximating who and what he is. Among the sons of the mighty is like the Lord, a God greatly feared in the council of the holy ones and awesome above all those who are around him. You've got that language again, the council of the holy ones. Sometimes this whole field of study is put under the rubric of divine counsel. You know, it's another, if you see it, divine counsel or unseen realm, a lot of times you're talking about the same thing. Okay, it's part of that same topic. Job 15, verse 15, behold, he puts no trust in his holy ones. So this is interesting. So the holy ones are there in the council, uh, and the heavens are not pure in his sight. The idea here is they're corruptible. We've learned this. The only ones that aren't are those who have been elected. Apart from that, they can be swayed. And we've examined several of these rebellions that we've had it as they unfolded in, particularly in the Old Testament. This term may refer to people, but it is more often used of spiritual beings in God's service. Here you've got it in a sermon of Moses, Deuteronomy 33, beginning at verse 2. He said, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came from the midst of 10,000 holy ones. And at his right hand were flashing and lightning for them. Okay. Again, the, one of the things that distinguishes them, it seems to be you get bright light, shining lights. That was the connection with the stars. Um, there's something about a radiance of their being if they're in spiritual form. And I'm noting here again in Job, holy ones uh, does not necessarily promote perfection here we've got it, chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, an earlier text. Can mankind be just before God? Can man be pure before his maker? He puts no trust even in his servants. That's also translated as holy ones. And against his angels, he charges error. So, you know, one of the things that we've, we've come to in this class is 
that when you look at all of the rebellion that's going on within the world, we see it every single day. It's in our homes, it's in our marriages, it's in the news for sure. You know, the newspapers we read, the other, the other kinds of outlets that we have about what's going on in the world, social media, I mean, it's everywhere. We have all of this. But one of the things we've gained from this class, I believe, is an understanding this is going on in the heavenly realm, too. Okay? Now, this doesn't mean that God doesn't have things under control. We've already covered that. But what I want you to see is how much he holds together with all this adversity. You know, aren't there days when you look at what's going on around and you say, how much can God take? You know, you see something new on the internet, something else that seems some, some level of perversion that's even lower than what you saw last week or last month. And you think to yourself, how, how bad can this get? How much can he take? Well, we're finding out there's a lot of rebellion that's going on in the heavenly realm as well. That will be one of the things in my last lesson, I'm calling it uh, closing thoughts, that we will deal with. How is it that there are heavenly rebellions if the Lord Jesus instructed us to pray our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lesson 19. They're also known as divine beings, and by that I mean lesser Elohim. This was covered in lesson two of our class. I'll pull it up again for you. Psalm 82, verse one and verse six. God, that is Elohim, it's singular because note the language there, God takes his stand. It's singular, there's no way that can be plural. Uh, in his own congregation, that could also read assembly, he judges in the midst of the rulers. The NAS puts it as rulers. Uh, many other versions put that as gods. It is the word Elohim. And as I introduced you in that lesson, Elohim can be singular or plural depending on the context. So the latter part of that verse reads, he judges in the midst of the rulers. You can't be in the midst of one. There's gotta be more. So the second use of Elohim is plural. And to translate it literally, that would be God takes his stand in his own congregation. He judges in the midst of the gods, small g. Look at verse 6. I said, God speaking, you are gods, is Elohim, and you are all sons of the Most High. So Elohim occurs twice in this verse, and by context, the second use is plural, yet most often it is in a singular sense referring to God alone. The Hebrew noun here occurs with the singular verb over 2,000 times in the Hebrew Bible in referring to God. Now some scholars have argued based on Psalm 82 that Israel in its early days was polytheistic. I think this is misguided. Uh, lesser Elohim do not possess any of Yahweh's attributes. We've covered this. Monotheism is intact. They do not approximate God. They're referred to as gods because they're Elohim. These are, they are the same residence, but not of the same power or composition. These lesser Elohim have been created. They also are sustained in some way. You know, all being comes from God. Every one of us has a heart that's beating in our chest. There's not, there are doctors all over the globe that can help you if you have a heart attack or if it stops to get it going again. But there's no one on the planet that can give this answer to the question, where does the electrical impulse come from to make it work? See, this emanates from God himself. He sustains that. And so these lesser Elohim 
We should not think of it being equal in any way, that it's polytheistic. They're all the same. And somehow it's almost like Hinduism where you have 2,000 or 3,000 various gods. They're all about the same. A little bit of a hierarchy there in some of the forms. But nonetheless, you get my point. We've been at pains to make this assertion that he is completely and, and totally unique in his being. Then we move on here. Now we've got terms that describe their position, okay? Their position. The first would be the word assembly, assembly, or also translated as council. It's found in both Psalm 82 and Psalm 89. We just covered this text. Here you have it. God takes his stand in his own Congregation. The NAS is putting it in congregation. Could also read assembly. Could also read council, some of your versions. Other terms include congregation, assembly, or assembled meeting. Interestingly enough, we also have the term court being used. I think it's very interesting. Look at Daniel chapter 7, beginning at verse 9. I kept looking until the thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vestiture was like white snow, his hair and his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames in wheels that were burning fire. You get that idea of the light, the brightness, okay, all that? Um, a river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him, and then we have this, thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, and the books were opened. Now, see, a lot of times when we think about this, you know, standing before the God and, uh, you know, the books being opened, we have a number of other places that's referred to in the Scripture. We think of God, you know, examining this, but here you have the heavenly host are there as well. The court is in session, same term. This idea of their council meeting. And what are they doing? Well, the books were opened. There's going to be some kind of an evaluation here, and they're involved. The thrones that are mentioned are also places in the court. Now, it's interesting when we think about Jesus' triumph after the crucifixion, I'm picking it up here in Paul's remarks to Philippi, chapter 2, beginning of verse 8. Speaking of Jesus, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So you've got this, this idea that there can be no question about the exaltation of Christ. You've got the whole trinity involved here. God the Father, God the Son, the Spirit is involved in awakening in us and bringing us to, uh, to Him and understanding the, the, what is going on and how we are being uh, brought to Him in forgiveness for our sins. There appears to be, there appears to be, and we've touched on this, three tiers that would be Yahweh at the top. That would be the council below, which is made up of the sons of God, and then angels. That is the position of Michael Heiser. He notes, he says there, many scholars have pointed out that there is a discernible hierarchy within the divine council. All council members, including Yahweh, are heavenly spirit beings. However, a careful comparison of the council terminology sketched here with texts from the ancient Canaan area, particularly Eucharist, we've talked about them, and the term sons of God 
An angel allows for one to discern three tiers in the council. So that would look like, as you see it on the screen, Yahweh, the Most High, God. Secondly, sons of God, or princes assigned to the nations. Additional positions of authority. We've talked about that in Deuteronomy 32. When they were assigned, they weren't fallen. But this is how they ended up with regional authority. And then angels. The Hebrew term here means messenger and refers, gen refers generally to the business journey or a trade mission in the Hebrew Bible. Now, Heiser is pretty firm on that. I would add at this point that an angel may be a son of God, that it's not a hierarchy. It could be a son of God that was tasked with a mission and is referred to as an angel. He is correct, though, that you don't find the word angel, the Hebrew term for that, connected at all in the Old Testament with the sons of God. You never see it. The word is used various times, you know, angels appeared, this and that, but you don't see it connected with sons of God. I'm saying I wouldn't be surprised if a son of God is tasked out of the council to go and do this or that is referred to in Scripture at that point as an angel because he's a messenger of something. Uh, I wouldn't go to war over it. I think it's possible that way, or it's possible, as Heiser has asserted, that there's a three-tiered system. That brings us to the term prince. Prince. It indicates hierarchy and authority, right? We certainly have this in Daniel, Chapter 10, beginning at verse 13, we have it. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. And then behold, Michael, one of, it's not, I don't have it uh, underlined, but you see it there. One of the chief princes came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. I mean, that, that verse is pregnant here. So you've got you got the prince of the kingdom of Persia that's withstanding an angel that's coming with a message, right? Then he needs Michael, one of the chief princes, to come and help him because he had been left there. And then we got the plural because he was dealing with the kings of Persia. So there, there's, there's more than one that are there withstanding him. Then verse 20, same chapter. Then he said, do you understand why I came to you? But I shall now return to fight against the prince of Persia. So I am going forth and behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. Okay. So when Jesus goes to the cross and raises from the dead, these powers, the authorities that they had, they were in some way disarmed. Okay. They were sentenced. They're, the crushing of them, starting with Satan himself, occurred then. And we had a number of passages that we looked at in the New Testament about how Jesus triumphed over them, right? But the ultimate sentence of their doom hasn't been carried out yet. It's been leveled, but it hasn't been carried out. And so we still find them in various places around the globe. But they cannot block the advance of the gospel. The gospel was designed, it started in Israel, to go out then to all the nations of the earth. That was the original intent. And so the seed of the woman, the actual ultimate seed, which is none other than Christ himself, came and crushed the serpent's head, but he's still around. Paul refers to him as the God of this world, and those who serve him are still around. But they cannot block the ultimate advance of the gospel. Actually, no one will be converted, you know, to the degree that we're seeing it, apart from this happening. Now, there were people in the Old Testament that weren't necessarily Jews that were being saved. I mean, a number of people that were coming in from other people groups Israel was the Old Testament church, for sure. And so they were being brought in, but that's not typical, okay? But when we get to the New Testament, 
Katie bar the door. I mean, there are people coming in net, left and right. And this is a whole problem for the, these, the, the early church leaders there. I mean, ch Acts chapter 2, all the way up to chapter 15, the whole backstory that's going on there is, well, what do we do with the Gentiles? I mean, they're coming to Christ. What are we going to do with them? Do they need to become Jews? Do they need to be circumcised? I mean, they had to call at the first general assembly at Jerusalem, chapter 15 of Acts, to look into this, and finally they determined, no, they're not to be circumcised. Of course, this becomes a problem later. That's why Paul writes the whole letter of Galatians, you know. And Peter got caught up in this, you know. It's another mistake here. You know, Peter got caught up. Yeah, I think they ought to be circumcised. No, Paul is saying, that's not the point. It is circumcision is of the heart, not the flesh. Okay? So the advance was going out. People were coming to God and confessing Christ as Lord as a result of what happened on the cross. The power that was there was given to the church to preach it to all nations. However, these powers still exist. They still resist the things of God. They resist us. They tempt us. Okay? They live for another day. Their doom is sealed, but they always live for one more day. We note here that not all members of the heavenly host are designated with this title, Prince. Princes of the supernatural realm are identified with the sons of God, assigned to the nations here. And we talked about this, Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, after the Babel event. Chief prince indicates a higher rank. You see it there again, chapter 10 of Daniel. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes. How many are there? Well, we don't know. But Michael was certainly Israel's prince. There's no doubt about that from the Old Testament. Verse 21 of chapter 10, however, I will tell you what is inscribed in the writing of the truth. Yet there is one who stands firmly with me against these forces, except excuse me, there is no one who stands firmly with me against these forces except Michael your prince. So that kind of nails it that Michael is the guardian angel, the, shouldn't be using that line, the, let's say the guardian son of God uh, over, over the nation there. That moves us into terms that describe their function. And we were just talking about angel, here we've got it. That's the first one up. The Hebrew term means messenger. The term may be used of human beings. You see it in Haggai chapter 1, it's Chronicles 36, Malachi chapter 2. Nevertheless, angelic messengers are at times described as men in the Old Testament. So we see it there, Genesis 18, we looked at these texts, verse 1, verse 2, verse 22. Uh, now, the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mara while he was sitting at the tent of the door in the heat of the day when he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him. Now, for sake of time, I'm not reading the whole text, but I think you know And if you go home tonight and read this, it's obviously these are not human beings that are talked about here. Verse 22. Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom while Abraham was standing before the Lord. Okay, so one of them is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, I think. We'll talk about that next week, the angel of the Lord. But right now, we notice that these other two men walked away. Again, it's interesting, they look like men. And every time they are in human form, they're noted as men. We even have that in the New Testament as well, around the time of the resurrection. Uh, one of the writers of the scripture, uh, New Testament, makes the point there that, you know, some have entertained angels unaware. unaware. You know, they look so human, wouldn't know.
But we also note that human form was not necessary for angelic interaction with people, okay? And particularly when we think about the powers of darkness, you know, going back to some of the things that I've taught you about that, that they can't make us do anything. None of us will be able to say before the Lord, yes, I did this, but it wasn't my fault, you know, I was made to do it, and that is not gonna work. You know, the devil made me do it, is not going to get past, you know, the utterance out of our mouth. They have the ability to foment, encourage, okay? They, they do all these things, but they can't make us do anything that we don't want to do. And I note that on this text, because, on this section, uh, because I think they, they interact with us. I mean, there are thoughts that are coming into our minds at times. And many times those thoughts are evil. Now, some of them might be percolating up from our evil nature, but some of them also might be attractive to our evil nature. We should be advised about that. So, terms of function, angel. Here's another one. Minister. Minister. We have it here in the psalm usage, Psalm 103, verse 21. It sometimes it's translated as serve. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you who serve him doing his will. Could also be rendered minister or serve. Same, same idea. Psalm 104, verse 4. He makes the winds his messengers, flaming fire his ministers. You know, what, 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 what do they do? They serve God. They worship God. They serve God. They do God's bidding. And here's another term. We had this one. Watcher. Watcher. This is an Aramaic term that occurs three times in the Old Testament. They're all in the same book. We looked at all of these. Daniel 4, here we have it, verse 13. I was looking in the visions in my mind as I lay on the bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, descended from heaven. I didn't include angelic there. We've noted this in the past. The New American Standard translators are inserting the word. They want the readers to be sure that as they're reading, they know this is not an earthly being. So they've inserted the word angel. But the Hebrew is just simply a watcher, a watcher. So I'm not going to include the word angel in all of these texts. Daniel chapter 4, verse 17. This sentence is by decree of the watchers, and the decision is a command of the holy ones. This is really interesting. <laughs> you know, we looked at this about the power that seems to be there. It's, you, you've got the council that's doing this, but then if you kept reading in, the, in this text, it is ordered by none other than God. So oftentimes you find the council involved in decision makings, but when it comes down to action being done, it's God is the one that does it. And verse 23 of chapter 4, in that the king saw a watcher, a holy one, descending from heaven and saying, okay, well, we looked at this word, and what I, what I was say, suggesting to you is that they're, they're watchers, they're, they're, they're observing all of the time. They don't sleep. They don't sleep. They're a watcher. Now, it's interesting here that... Uh, This term is used extensively in that second temple Jewish literature that we've highlighted so many times. Watcher. The term also has a connection to the Akkadian dialect material and in specific individuals that I highlighted for you known as the Apkalu. We looked at that. Okay, we've got a lot of uh, re relics. We've got a lot of um, archaeology on the Apkalu. Their history 
in Babylon is strangely similar to Genesis 6, 1 to 4. Very similar uh, that we find this. And, you know, even the result of a union with women resulting in a blending of divine and human, two-thirds apkalu, one-third human, even to that extent. It was Amar Anas, I've quoted him a number of times, his work on the origin of the Watchers. He writes this, figurines of the Apkalu were buried in boxes as foundation deposits in Mesopotamian buildings in order to avert evil from the house. They put them at the four corners of, of the building. The term Watchers is used uh, of these sets of figurines in Akkadian incantations according to ritual text. And the appellation matches the Aramaic term, the wakeful ones, the watchers, for both good and the watchers uh, being bad. So what, what I'm saying to you here is that the, the idea of the apkalu um, a lot of this language of the watchers is wrapped up in them. And it has the same kind of a root. That's what he means here by the appellation. The wakeful ones, the watchers, the apkalu, it has the same sense to it. And it's used interchangeably as you're looking at some of their documents. Interestingly enough, that term watcher is used extensively in Enoch, the book of the giants, in Jubilees, and a few others. They draw on this Mesopotamian material for retelling the events associated with the flood. The term watchers, interestingly enough, in that, that genre, the Second Temple writings, all of it, in the overwhel this is the overwhelming choice of term for fallen ones, fallen sons of God. Now, Daniel doesn't necessarily use it that way. But in this other material, that is the preferred term for those who fell. That's what we know. The next word, you've come across this many times, host. H-O-S-T, or mighty ones. 2 Kings 22, verse 19 Micah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven. Where were they? They were standing by him on his right and on his left. The picture we get here is that God is typically not alone. You know, could he be alone? Of course he could be. But it seems as though when you have these pictures of the heavenlies, these sons of God are there. They're attending him. They're contemplating things. God is surrounded by his heavenly host of these spirit beings. Here's some more, uh, more text, Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you who serve him doing his will. That could also read minister, you who minister him. Psalm 148, verse 2, praise him, all his angels, praise him, all his hosts. I've got some other passages here. They're in my notes if you want to look at them. A connected term here to the word host is the word Lord. Lord of hosts, you've seen that. In other words, the clear understanding that God is the commander-in-chief of what's going on. The probable Hebrew meaning here is Yahweh the Almighty. The Almighty. He is the uncontested Lord of all heavenly powers. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4. So the people sent to Shiloh, and from there they carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts. There, there's, there's no confusion here at all regarding the power and the authority and the position of Yahweh as the Most High God. None. 
So if you ever run into somebody that's touched on this study and they say, well, you know, I'm not as interested in that. I'm a little concerned about it. It's polytheistic and, you know, somehow there's, there's all these other gods and, you know, God is just kind of combating with them. That is not the case, okay? They're all spiritual beings, but there is no one like the Most High. And that is Moses' preferred term for him. He is the most high God. It begs the question, if he's most high, then there must be some others here. But they're in no way like him except by the fact that they are spiritual beings. So uh, what we picked up on here is that the word Elohim, as it relates to God, is better understood as an address, a, a residence. Where are they from? They're from the spiritual realm. And not a set of attributes. Because all too often when we see the word Elohim, we think God, we think immediately the attributes of God. Well, as it relates to the Most High, very appropriate. But not to these lesser Elohim. Psalm 148, verse 2, praise him, all his angels, praise him, all his hosts. So we've got this connected term, Lord of hosts. Lord is pro the probable meaning of the Hebrew context is kind of like Yahweh the Almighty or God the King, or it could also be the uncontested Lord of all heavenly powers. I mean, that's the idea. And that brings us to pretty familiar cherubim, seraphim. It's fascinating things on this one. Both terms describe the same function. They have the connotation of guardianship of the presence of God. They're somehow around the throne and they're guards that are there. They are indeed divine creatures. Both are said to have had wings, though the number varies. You can look at Exodus 25 on that, Exodus 37, Isaiah 6. The cherubim are at times assigned four faces. Human, bovine, and other parts. Take a look at it. Ezekiel chapter 1, beginning at verse 10. As for the form of their faces, each had the face of a man. All four had the face of a lion. On the right and on the face of the bull and on the left, all four had the face of an eagle. Ask me what all, that all means. I don't know. But I will do a little deeper dive on the word seraphim. Seraphim is the plural form of the Hebrew term translated as, listen carefully, snake. Snake. Okay. Now, Numbers 21, verse 6 and verse 8. I don't, think, I don't have this on the screen. Let me give it to you. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. Verse 8. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard, and it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. The word there, serpent, is our term seraphim. Both terms are never associated with the term angel. Consequently, it is wrong to think of them as angels. Some view the terminology behind seraphim with the word sarf, which means to burn, but more recent research suggests that it is more likely that seraphim derives from a Hebrew noun, which in turn is drawn from Egyptian throne guardian terminology. Heiser gives us a note on this. As recent research demonstrates, 
the Egyptian Uraeus, and I put on that, the emblem of an Egyptian goddess who protects the pharaoh. This, this emblem, this Uraeus, a serpent drawn from two species of Egyptian cobras, fits the elements of the supernatural seraphim who attend Yahweh's holy presence in Isaiah 6. The relevant cobra species spit burning venom can expand wide flanges of skin on either side of their bodies, considered wings in antiquity, when threatened and are obviously serpentine. Joannes notes the protective nature of them, quote, a function of them is to protect the Pharaoh and the sacred objects by breathing out fire on his enemies. Okay. I didn't spend a lot of time on this. I'll just give you a tidbit on this for you to think about. It's possible that the serpent of Genesis chapter 6, he's called that because that's how they look. Okay? We don't know that for sure. But it's possible. We tend to think of snakes as always being bad. Okay? You know? But there is an etymology connection here with the word as it relates to seraphim. So it's just interesting to think about that. Um, and, you know, another thing that's interesting too, I think um, it may be uh, Douglas Van Dorn in his work on his book, Giants. I think he gets into this a little bit more, that um, you find in a lot of the other uh, ancient uh, discovered archaeology of people groups that were around Israel, that oftentimes when you look at the pictures and these you know, iconographs that are on these walls and things like that, oftentimes these beings that are depicted are serpentine. Okay. Now, immediately, when I looked at it years ago, I thought, well, yeah, I mean, they're serpent eyes are evil. Well, they may be, but it may have something to do with the way they appear. So, someday, we'll find out. <laughs> then it won't matter. <laughs> then it won't matter, but it'll be interesting. <laughs> now I want to move on to brief times that the heavenly army has been revealed within the scripture. Remember I said to you early on, there is far more in the word of God about the powers of darkness than there are about the host of heaven. It just is. I mean, we touched on most of it tonight. The rest of the time I just spent the better part of this course talking about the powers of darkness. Nonetheless, we come to 2 Kings chapter 6 here, beginning at verse 14. I don't have this on the screen. He sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. Now when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Okay? So we, we're just not conscious of all of this going on around us. But nonetheless, they're there. And it's interesting that the image at the time, uh, they're in battle array. Okay? They're ready to do battle. And as you read the text further, when they came down to him, Elijah pray, Elisha prayed and said to the Lord, Strike this people with blindness, I pray. So he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. So, I, you know, 
I think that's the best way if you're a servant at this period of time, you're looking up at the heavenly host. Oh, here they are. They're in chariots and they're in, they're in um, regalia as, as an army. Does that mean they're always that way? Probably not. And they didn't pull their swords out and do anybody with uh, being run through, but they were smitten. The opposing forces were smitten with blindness. So there's great power here. Mighty is God's army, but it is often taken lightly. When you talk about most Christians and the way they, they think about this, you know, it's the idea, well, these people, they have wings, you know, they have halos over their head. You know, they're, they're, they don't convey the biblical picture of the heavenly army. I mean, these beings are incredibly powerful. Oh, no, they, no, they've spoken. We have examples of that, Katie. I mean, um, the, the, the men that appeared to Lot, that, okay. they spoke. No, that's not what she asked. She asked if they spoke something into being. Yes. Oh, like God can. No, they can't. They speak to us. Is that what you meant? Well, I sort of did, yeah. No, they can. Only God can speak something into existence. That's the uh, Latin on that is ex nihilo. So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He spoke it into existence. Think about us. I mean, we might create things. I mean, somebody crafted, look at these pews, all this wood and the tough thing that's on them. We need material to make things. Only the Most High God can speak things into existence. These lesser Elohim cannot do that, but they can, 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 uh, can talk to us. Now, that's one of the places, the only one I really know of within the scripture where it seems like the curtain is pulled back and we actually do see the heavenly host there and all their regalia ready to go to battle. But interestingly enough, we do have a couple testimonies by secular historians on this. So, if you go back in time, you, you might remember that the entire nation of Israel is completely devastated in A.D. 70. That siege, it's part of the Jewish wars. The Romans it is a mainstay, the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. They keep order. If somebody gets out of line, they might get away with it for a while, but it's going to be the amount of time it takes to march an army from who knows where to get over to where you are, but then you're going to have to pay the pauper. Okay? They were adamant about this, and they were ruthless in maintaining order. So there's a rebellion that happens in Palestine, more than once. And it, it starts earlier, and then you have uh, the Roman legions beginning to work their way in to this whole region. The war starts around 68 A.D. It goes all the way up to 73 A.D. But in A.D. 70, that was the culmination of the siege of Jerusalem. And, you know, the reporting on that is absolutely off the chart of what happened there. I mean, they were making an example of people. They'd grab whoever it was they could get, stick them on our, uh, crucify them, uh, impale them. They wanted everything that could be horrifying to be made known there because you don't mess with who's in power, okay? So we have some interesting things here regarding the destruction of the temple We've got Josephus reports this. I've got it on the screen. He gives us this account. I suppose the account of it would seem to be a fable were it not related by those who saw it. And were not the events that followed it of so considerable nature as to deserve such signals. For before sunsetting, chariots, and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running about in the clouds and surrounding of the cities. Moreover, at the feast, which we call Pentecost, as the priests were going by night in the inner court of the temple, 
as their custom was to perform their sacred ministrations, they said that in the first place they felt a quaking and heard a great noise. And after that, they heard a sound of a great multitude saying, let us remove hence. Okay, this is the moment where God pulls back from the nation. And I think what you've got here is a fulfillment of Jesus' remarks in the Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse is in um, Mark 14, Luke 21, Matthew 24. These, what signs will accompany your, your coming, you know? And a lot of times from a Christian perspective, we look at this and immediately say, oh yeah, this is talking about the second coming. But there's time after time in the gospel accounts that Jesus is saying, this generation will not pass away before you see these things. And so a lot, not all, but a lot of what's contained in that Olivet Discourse, recorded three separate locations in the Gospels, happened. It happened in A.D. 70. Now here's the interesting thing about it. Luke is the one that basically gives us information on it and says, look, when you see armies that are surrounding, round about, don't, don't stop and get your cloak. I mean, don't worry about what's on the oven for tonight's dinner. Get out. The interesting thing here is the Christians did in large part abide that. When they start to see the abiding armies and Rome is coming in and there's indiscriminate killing, a lot of them, they did run out. Now, here's what's going on there. I think that it, the, God never does want anything for one reason. There's always something, more, multitude going on. But here's one of the aspects that happened to this. Remember, when the church begins, it, it's largely, it, it, it was looked at as a sect of Judaism. You know, it was, that's how it was understood. And even the Christians, they, they basically kind of hung around Jerusalem because this is where the temple was, right? And it was centered there. When we get to that episode that happens, we're talking about the, 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 uh, the Gentiles. What do we do about them? They hold this first council. Where do they have it? Jerusalem, okay? Acts 15. They're, they're centered there. When A.D. 70 occurs, this literally catapults the church out of Jerusalem and becomes the basis for extraordinary missionary evangelism. Okay? The fascinating thing about this is, is from that moment, in about 200 years, the Roman Empire will acknowledge Christianity as the state religion. Okay? Without a shot being fired, you know, without a sword being pulled, except the sword of the Spirit. Okay, this happens at A.D. 70. And so we have this, this curse that's coming down. There's somehow, there's a protection over the nation which is removed at this point in time. It's probably a fulfillment of Matthew 27, beginning at verse 24. You see it on the screen. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. And all the people said, his blood shall be on us and on our children. Okay. Now, does that mean that there aren't any Jews that are going to be called into the kingdom? No. The Jews have been being saved all along, and they will continue to be. But at this juncture of history, I think when you put that text together with what is said on, in Matthew, again, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 14, Jesus predicted that there's going to be a day when there's not going to be one stone left when we're talking about the temple. It's going to be destroyed. And this is when the whole thing is brought down. Titus is the commander. He was absolutely ruthless. You go to Rome to this day, you go to the triumphal arch, and you look carefully at that, and you're going to see relics that he's bringing back 
embedded in the rock from where? From the temple. Okay, it's right there in Rome to this day. So, we've got this army here where Josephus records there was a quaking. They heard a great noise, and after that they heard the sound of a great multitude saying, let us remove hence. Something there indicating they're pulling back. And then we have it from a different historian, that being Tacitus. He remarks regarding the same episode, there had been seen hosts joining in battle in the skies. The fiery gleam of arms, the temple illuminated by a sudden radiance from the clouds, the doors of the inner shrine were suddenly thrown open and a voice of more than mortal tone was heard to cry, the gods are departing. At the same instance, there was a mighty stir as of departure. Okay. Extraordinary. You know, un un unreal when you think about this. Now, I, I also, somewhere in my notes, I also have some of the recording of Tac uh, on Tacitus, but uh, Titus on this. And he made a comment, a derogatory comment, about the fall of Jerusalem and uh, a people whose God has left them. You know, even a remark by him in that way. So, you know, can we bank on this? I don't know. I mean, they are secular historians here. We've quoted Josephus before. Nonetheless, this was floating around at the time that people had heard and saw these things that were extraordinary. There are a few more peaks behind the curtain. Let me just give you this. Genesis chapter 32, 1 and 2. Remember this, that Jacob went on his way. The angels of God met him. Jacob said to them, this is God's camp. And so he named it that. Okay, that, that. That would have been, that's one of the things I would like to know, what that was like. You know, <laughs> they, they were there. Jacob, you remember, he saw Jacob's ladder. Okay, and there's angels ascending and descending on this thing. It's probably a ziggurat that's going up into the heavenlies. Psalm 68, verse 17. The chariots of God are myriads, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them as at Sinai in his holiness. I think when we think about things like, you know, the Sinai where the nation is gathered they're there to receive the law, and when God comes down and starts speaking, this is when <laughs> the people were like, from now on, you talk to them. We're done, you know? God had instructed them, don't get anywhere near that mountain, you're going to die. If an animal goes up there, it's going to die. They got lightning, we got thunder, we got the voice of God there. I think, you know, if the heavens would have been pulled back more, you would have had the armies of heaven there. Okay. There, is a, there is a text also that says that the law was mediated by angels. Okay, interestingly enough. So, uh, you know, but we don't see all this. We only get a few places where this curtain is pulled back. But it is there all the time. And we note here as we close out, the heavenly hosts do not cease in worship and service to the Most High, and this will be our destiny as well. Revelation chapter 4, beginning in verse 6, And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal, and in the center and around the throne the four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. And the first creature was like a lion. The second creature was like a calf. The third had the face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around within day and night. They do not cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come.
There's a statement of his aseity. That is, again, another one of these aspects of God they know nothing of. God has always existed. He exists, and he will continue to exist. No one else has the power of being except him. Whether we're talking about in the earthly realm or in the supernatural, unseen realm, the heavenly realm, their being emanates from God himself. It's, put it this, this way, it's all about God, guys. It is all about God. I mean, if you want to know what we're going to be doing in heaven, besides having an illumination of our understanding, is that we're going to be joining with the heavenly host, singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And there's not going to be one person that's going to be bored. You know, haven't we sung this for the 105th time, you know, since, since we were raptured, you know? No one. No one. I mean, this is timeless. This is what it's, what it's all about. So how, how, does this, how does this relate to you? Well, there are times in our Christian walks when we really feel like we're alone. There are times when we have besieged God for an answer to a prayer that we have brought to him many, many, many times. Many days, sometimes with fasting, and God hasn't answered that prayer. And there may be feelings within our humanity or it could be the powers of darkness that are planting a seed there that he just doesn't hear. He's not interested. I think what you all need to see and understand is that no matter what is going on in your life, the God of the universe is aware of what's going. And there are those who attend him who look after his people. You have no consciousness of it. You know, you just wrecked a car. You know, maybe you even got injured. But there was something going on behind the scenes you had no knowledge of at all. The world would just say, well, it's happenstance. I mean, it's what happens. You take a turn too fast, you're going to flip the car and it's going to roll. God loves his people and he looks on for them. It's the powers of darkness that would like to convince you that he's not interested in everything that's going on in your life. But the truth is, he's interested in all of it. All of it. And it's the ploy of the powers of darkness to try to convince you he doesn't see. There's been no answer on this. So how do we understand this? Well, the understanding is that God has called us to interact with crisis in this life. And because we're human beings, we don't want crisis. I mean, I want things on an even keel. I'm a planner. I want to plan for every single thing that could possibly go wrong because when I get there, I want to smooth it out once I'm there. Ask my wife. But he puts us in situations that we do not have the power to control. It could be a health problem. It could be a marriage partner. It could be a rebellious son or a daughter. It could be a boss. It could be a neighbor next door. the, The list is endless. And he calls on us to interact with crisis because in these situations you have no one else to go to except God and we need to turn to him. But see, in our humanness, we get frustrated because I feel like I have turned to him and he hasn't heard. We're walking in the steps of Christ. Jesus interacted with crisis and eventually died a tragic death. We need to get used to the idea that in this world, the typical route is that we lose. 
we die. And yet, we actually win. Because we're living our lives out for a kingdom and a nation and a habitat that is not of this world. The powers of darkness want to convince you that this is not relevant for your particular crisis in your life. It's not true. Is that we're called to interact with these things and it causes us to grow and there's a strange way this happens that we, we grow in a depth of, of love for God in the midst of pain. Beloved believers have been dying since Jesus went to the cross and many of them have had very difficult deaths and have seen very, very tragic things. It wasn't that God didn't love them but he had a plan for them and he loved them every bit as much as you. And because we are forgiven of our sins, every day is a good day. And whatever crisis I'm in, whatever is wrong in my life, God is attentive to that. And the hosts of heaven are attentive to that. They are there to do his bidding. And many, many times, They've been in and around you where you had absolutely no awareness whatsoever. Do we bring them worship? Do we bring esteem to them? Do we put up little statues in our house with angels? We don't do any of that. All of the worship, all of the focus is on Yahweh, the Most High God. Everything else is peripheral. They are extensions of his hand. When Nero gave an order, he said, I want this done. His centurions went out there, or tribunes, they carried out exactly what he wanted. God administrates his universe in a lot of similarities in that way. All we're getting right now is an understanding that this is in some ways how he does it. It's not entirely, but in some ways this is how he does it. He does it through his heavenly host. You can't fail. You can lose in this life. You can lose your health. You can lose your wealth. You can lose your friends. You can lose your husband. You can lose your wife. You can lose your children. You can lose all kinds of things. Christians have been losing things since the beginning but we win. We win. This is part of the backstory, but it interfaces with the story, you know, where, where Paul is saying that what God began in you, he will complete it. Do not question the route he takes you on to bring completion. Remember, he is the most high God. Job tried it. It didn't work. Just, just give, me a, give me the reason. Give me, give, let me make heads or tails out of this. It's not happening. Our rest has to be in him. The powers of darkness are on the one side trying to encourage us to lose that understanding and go into bitterness and hardness of heart while at the other side of the coin the uh, powers of heaven, the host of heaven, the ministers that serve God are there at his disposal to encourage and watch over us when need be. And you don't know, even if in an automobile accident, where you came out of the thing with a paralyzed left side, that there still wasn't the host of heaven that were there that saved your life. See, it would be the powers of darkness that would say, well, if he really had your attention, you wouldn't have gone into this mess. Now look at you. So this is reality. This is what happens to human beings. Things go wrong in this world. It's been affected by sin. But God always has our best interests at heart, and he's working in and behind the scenes with those who attend him 
to bring about his will in our life. Why do you see this? Why are you here? For those of you that are watching on the video, why are you taking the time to do this? Tens of thousands, millions of people are absolutely oblivious to the things we're talking about, and yet you're here. Why is that? It's because of the prompting of the Holy Spirit, His favor, the favor that you have with Him. You're His kids. That's why. The unbelievers out here are doing whatever they do on a Monday night. On your worst day, it's always a good day. Because it's all about Him. The Westminster Confession, the Shorter Catechism, question number one, what is the chief end of man? Answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. I mean, that is what we do. We end up joining the sons of God in the heavenlies to bring glory to God, even when we're suffering, because it's all about Him. We lose, but we win. In Jesus' name. See you next week.